Good morning everyone and welcome to our service this Sunday the 27th of December. We hope you all had a wonderful Christmas. I love the few days after Christmas because I don't have to think about what to cook. Usually every meal is just a Christmas dinner sandwich except for breakfast which is usually just a few quality streets. I hope you've all been doing something similar over the last few days. But just now as we enter into this time of worship before God, we want to do this thing that we do every Sunday, which is we have the confession, where we bring before God the things that we have perhaps done wrong or have separated us from him over the last week. So let's join together in that now. Beloved in Christ, we come to offer to God, Almighty God, our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear his holy word proclaimed, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that in the power of his spirit we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. And so let us confess our sins to God our Father. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour, in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, and now I'd like to invite Bishop David, who has prepared a, a video sermon for us this Sunday, to give us our address today. Good morning. I'm going to pray. May the words of my lips and the thoughts of all our hearts be this day and always acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this morning, two days after Christmas Day, with the Christmas lights still lit in, our, in many of our homes and the Christmas food probably still on many of our tables and hopefully as safely as we can, family still being able to gather together. I want to open up just a few verses from today's reading in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. It's a wonderful phrase that Paul uses here, the fullness of time, when the fullness of time had come. It speaks of that time of the birth of Jesus Christ, the time of Christ's coming into this world. It was in every sense God's time. It was in every sense the right time. Historically, it was that time in history when the known inhabited nations had all been conquered by the Roman Empire and were under the rule of the Roman Emperor. Literally as well, it was a time when there was a worldwide road network that made travel and communication across the known world possible and easier. It was also a time when there was a common language, the Greek language, that most of the then inhabited earth had at least some knowledge of. But above all, it was a time when the nations and the world and the peoples of the world were, were hungry for, for a faith and for a religion that would be both true and relevant and satisfying. And it was at such a time, the, the fullness of time that God sent forth his Son, that Christ came into the world. Paul tells us, when the fullness of time had come, 
God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive redemption as sons. It's an incredible truth. And we've been celebrating this truth over this Christmas season, as best we know how in these challenging days to, to celebrate. And we've heard the, the words of John's Gospel in John 1 verse 14, the Word, God became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. On at least another eight occasions, Paul refers to us as God's children, as God's sons, as God's daughters, as children by adoption, as children by grace. And all because at the fullness of time, Jesus came. And Jesus came to save us from, from sin. Similar to Paul, John uses a similar language to speak of God sending his Son into the world when the fullness of time had come. Jesus came down from heaven to earth. Uh, and so there's this wonderful truth. We are no longer slaves, but sons and daughters and heirs through God. Heirs of our heavenly, eternal Father. God sent Jesus into the world to redeem this world. What does that mean? Well, it, it means that Jesus came to pay the price in full for the sins of the whole world. It means that Jesus came to deliver humanity from slavery and from bondage to sin and its hold over our lives. It means that Jesus came to set us free from everything that enslaves us by way of sin and selfishness and self-centeredness. It means that he came to give us life and to exchange the gift of life for, for death. God reached down from heaven to earth uh, and by God's grace, the scriptures tell us that we're justified. It's wonderful language. We're justified through the redemption that is ours in Jesus Christ. Even his very name, Jesus, tells us that he came to save people, to save us from our sins. God sent Jesus as a human. He, he sent Jesus into this world as a man, as a, as a baby boy. He was born of a human mother but conceived supernaturally by the work of the Holy Spirit. He was both human and divine, both God and man. Born, we are told here by Paul, under the law. His mother was Jewish. Jesus was born into a Jewish home. He was part of a Jewish family, subject to the Jewish law. He was born under the law. But he, like none before him, submitted himself to that law and successfully fulfilled all the requirements of the Old Testament Jewish law because he was without sin. He was sinless. He was without fault. He was perfect God and at the same time perfect man. Divine as God's son, but also a human being, but perfect, sinless. So he alone was qualified to pay the price or to take the punishment due to all mankind on the face of the whole earth for our disobedience and for our sinfulness. For all had sinned. And after him, all would sin. But he, the sinless Son of God, alone was qualified to pay the price for the sins of the whole world to redeem sinful humanity. I love the way that John Stott puts it. He says, if he had not been a righteous man, he could not have redeemed unrighteous persons. That's all of us. And if he had not been God's son, he could not have redeemed us for God and made us the sons and daughters of God. You see, when we choose to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. When we choose to become followers of God, we become royal children. We become children of the King of Kings 
and of the Lord of Lords. And Christmas is that season when we mark that wonderful historical moment in history when the fullness of time had come, when heaven came down to earth, when God became a baby boy and then went on to grow into manhood, sinless, sinless, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons, as children of God. It's, it's, it's absolutely incredible. It's a, it's a wonderful truth that we've been celebrating over these days of Christmas. We've sung that truth, sacred infant, all divine. What a tender love was thine thus to come from highest bliss down to such a sinful world as this. And we often in our morning services say, blessed be the Lord God of Israel for he has visited and redeemed his people. A man called Sandy Miller, he was the rector of Holy Trinity Brompton and he tells a story of how once he found himself at Gatwick Airport. He was trying along with several hundred others to fly off on holiday with his family. Planes were being cancelled, deaths closed, queues of people changing from one line to another. Those were the days, weren't they? Trying to get information. Uh, when he bumped into an old friend in the queue in front of him that he hadn't seen for many years, and as their conversation unfolded, casting his eyes to the ceiling, Sandy's friend said to him, Oh, please assure me that hell will not be as bad as this. To which Sandy, in his very gentle and very godly way, paused for quite a long pause and then said to his friend, I'm so sorry, it will be worse and it will be eternal and without end. You see, my friends, the issue is salvation. The issue really is where are you and where am I going to spend eternity, heaven or hell? The issue is salvation. The trust entrusted to our church is the issue of salvation. He came to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as his sons and daughters. In these verses that Paul opens up to us, he, he, he just lays bare that incredible truth before us. Uh, and elsewhere, John in John's Gospel uh, invites us to grasp and to, uh, and to take hold of both the invitation and the, and the challenge that is the challenge of salvation. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. It's through Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life. God sent his Son. That's what we've been celebrating in these days of Christmas. And secondly, and more briefly, God sent the Spirit of his Son to live in us. Paul tells us, and because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son, and of a son, then an heir through God. God sent Jesus into the world, and God has also sent his Holy Spirit into our hearts. That Spirit cries, Abba, Father. The Spirit of God lives in everyone that believes in Jesus Christ and has given their life to Christ and has trusted personally in Christ. Elsewhere in Romans, Paul said, if, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Jesus, throughout his earthly ministry, knew intimacy and a closeness to his Father 
the uh, Bible translator J.P. Phillips expressed it so beautifully when he spoke of it as Father, dear Father, Father, dear Father. Because Jesus came, because the fullness of time came and Jesus was born into this world, we can have the status of becoming the sons and the daughters of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The entitlements and the rights of God's children become ours. And it's the Holy Spirit that enables us to enter into that intimacy and to enjoy that intimacy and to experience that affection and to enter right into the near presence of God. I love the way, again, that John Stott expressed it. He said, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, witnessing to our sonship and prompting our prayers is the precious privilege of all God's children. As his sons and as his daughters, God sent the Spirit, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, into our lives. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit, God himself, living in us. Uh, Canon David Watson used to tell the story, a little bit humorous, but uh, a profound truth of the Sunday school class who had been learning the creed. And, and the great day came when they came into the church to recite it in front of the whole congregation. The teacher looked at the first child. Uh, I believe in God the Father. Uh, and then the second child said, I believe in God the Son. And then there was a ghastly silence that seemed to go on forever. And a little voice piped up from the back, please miss. The boy who believes in the Holy Spirit isn't here this morning. Uh, we smile at that truth, but I wonder as we emerge uh, through this worldwide pandemic and as the church seeks to build and rebuild and as the church seeks to proclaim Christ faithfully, I wonder as we move towards a a new year is the boy or the girl or the man or the woman who believes in the Holy Spirit present? Are, are we there believing and uh, trusting in the Holy Spirit? We need to not only believe in him but enter into all that the Holy Spirit would do in our lives and bring to our lives by way of life and intimacy, and prayerfulness, and devotion, and, and holiness before our holy God. Paul said, and because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then and there, through God. So let's open up our hearts, let's open up our lives, let's in our churches seek the presence of God's Spirit. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to deepen our experience of God and our relationship with God because He makes us new. He comes to those who ask. In Luke eleven thirteen, we write, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The late Michael Green very honestly wrote and talked about how after his conversion, when he had surrendered his life to Christ's Lordship, a prized area of disobedient selfishness needed to be handed over by him to to Christ and to God and to the work of his Spirit. He needed to do a deep work of repentance. And he writes this, after the battle and the surrender, I was flooded with joy and peace and a sense of his power. So let's each of us and all of us press on and press in praying, come Holy Spirit. Uh, more, Lord, make me holy before you. Having trusted in Christ, who in the fullness 
of time came, having believed in Jesus Christ for salvation. Let's pursue an even closer, deeper, holier, more obedient walk with God. The hymn writer put it beautifully, just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus, this my plea, daily walking close with thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. On this last Sunday of 2020, let's choose to lay before Christ our sin, our shame, perhaps some believing and trusting in Christ for salvation, even for the very first time. And let's all of us in our churches open our hearts, open our lives, open our churches and the institutions of our churches to the wind of God's Spirit. I think it's summed up for me in a single inscription found on the grave of a Swiss mountain guide that simply said, died climbing. Let us pray. And so, loving Lord Jesus, on this last day of 2020, we welcome your Holy Spirit's presence wherever we are in our homes or in our churches today. And Lord, I pray that there would be some who would, in this moment, choose to believe that Jesus came in the fullness of time for them, would choose to trust that they are loved by God, and would choose to give their life in full surrender to Jesus Christ as Lord. And Lord, I pray that the wind of your Spirit would so blow right now into all of our hearts and lives, but Lord, we would lay bare before you who we are, and that we would seek to live holy lives, holier lives, allowing you, Lord, to search our hearts, so that, Lord God, we would repent, turn away from anything that would be a blockage between us and you, and that we would follow you, that we would love you, that we would pursue you, and that we would know intimacy with you, that we would follow you closely, indeed all the days of our lives. So pour out your Holy Spirit upon all of us and each of us and upon our churches in these days, that because the fullness of time came and because Jesus came, and because the Holy Spirit has been sent to live in our hearts, we will be transformed into the likeness of Christ for his glory. And in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Bishop David, for that, that lovely sermon. There is a lot for us to think about this Sunday. And so now, just as we bring our time of worship to a close, Let's bow our heads in prayer. You can follow along with the responses um, just above. They will be attached to this post. And just do that and then we will finish with the Lord's Prayer. Lord Jesus, we ask you to protect us from the coronavirus. You are powerful and merciful. Let this be our prayer. Have mercy on me, my God, have mercy on me. For in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. Jehovah Shalom, Lord of Peace, we remember those living in coronavirus hotspots and those currently in isolation. May they know your presence in their isolation, your peace in their turmoil, and your patience in their waiting. Prince of Peace, you are powerful and merciful. Let this be their prayer. May your mercy come quickly to meet us. For we are in desperate need. Help us, God our Saviour, for the glory of your name. God of all comfort and counsel, 
We pray particularly for those who are grieving because of this virus, reeling from the sudden loss of loved ones. May they somehow know your fellowship in their suffering, your comfort in their loss, and your hope in their despair. We name before you those known to us who are vulnerable and scared, the frail, the sick, and the elderly. God of all comfort, you are powerful and merciful. May this be our prayer. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope, and he will continue to deliver us. Jehovah Rapha, God who heals, we pray for all medical professionals dealing daily with the intense added pressures of this crisis. Grant them resilience in weariness, discernment in diagnosis, and compassion upon compassion as they care. We thank you for the army of researchers cooperating towards the cure. Give them clarity, serendipity, and unexpected breakthrough today. Would you rise above this present darkness as the sun of righteousness with healing in your rays? May this be our prayer. Sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. God of all wisdom, we pray for our leaders, the World Health Organization and national governments and local leaders too, heads of schools, hospitals and other institutions. Since you have positioned these people in public service for this hour, we ask that you grant them wisdom beyond their own wisdom to contain this virus, faith beyond their own faith to fight this fear, and strength beyond their own strength to sustain vital institutions through this time of turmoil. God of all wisdom and counsel, you are powerful and merciful. May this be our prayer. God is our refuge and strength and an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. So may El Shaddai, the Lord Almighty, who loves you, protect you. May Jesus Christ, his Son, who died for you, save you. And may the Holy Spirit, who broods over the chaos and fills your life with peace, intercede for you and in you for others at this time. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now we close by singing the beautiful hymn, hymn 172, if you have a hymn book with you. O come, all ye faithful.
by saying the words that Jesus taught us to pray. So let's bow our heads as we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, just as we close, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.